Thank you. You may be seated. It's always a delight to have one of our missionaries with us, and Brother Olson is certainly no stranger to this place. We appreciate the work that he is doing in Brazil, his stand against apostasy, his stand for fundamentalism, his stand for good music, his stand against the charismatic movement. We praise God that we have a man like that representing the body of Christ in Brazil, a dark and dangerous country. And so it's with great joy and delight that we have him come to preach to us today about beware of wolves. Brother Olson, bring the word. Well, I had chosen this uh, topic and this sermon uh, a couple months ago to preach this on this date here in Philadelphia area, and I had no idea that it would be so fitting uh, with the Pope being here today, uh, with a million people supposed to be in Philadelphia to hear the Pope today. And of course, he's the greatest wolf in the world today, and uh, wolf in sheep's clothing, and it's interesting that just providentially that fit together with my sermon for today. Well, let's turn there to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. Here we have Paul's great farewell address uh, to the church at Ephesus. And you know, there have been many great farewell addresses in history. Uh, we have Washington's great farewell address here in the United States. We have uh, MacArthur's farewell address at West Point. And here we have Paul with a great farewell address to the church at Ephesus, the place where he had spent more time than any other place in his ministry. And here he gives them his farewell address, and it's something that's very interesting for them and for all time. And verse 17 of Acts chapter 20, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer. O Lord, we thank Thee for the opportunity to study Thy Word this morning. We pray that Thou would open it up to us. Help us to behold wondrous things out of Thy law, out of Thy Word. And O Lord, help us to beware of wolves. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we have Ephesus, the place where Paul spent the most time, three years, and he's speaking to the elders at Ephesus. And in verse 18, he talks about when he came into Asia. When he talks about Asia here, he's not talking about China, he's not talking about uh, places like that, but he's talking about the Roman province of Asia, uh, which was Ephesus, there in Turkey. And he came into Asia, and he tells them, you know what manner I have been with you at all seasons. And Paul begins by telling them that they had watched him for three years there. They knew everything about him. Uh, basically, they knew how he lived from day to day. And he knew what kind of, they knew what kind of testimony he had. And he was not a hypocrite. You know, that was a big problem in the time of Jesus. You had the Pharisees. The Pharisees were hypocrites. They preached one thing, but they lived something else. But Paul here, he was telling the people at Ephesus that they knew that he was not a hypocrite, that he was not preaching one thing and living something else, but he was living what he had been preaching. And you know, that's the problem with all these big preachers, big personalities on the radio, on the TV, uh, the Pope and others. You know, you don't know what kind of life they live. Uh, from day to day. You can only hear their preaching. And, uh, you know, it's good to know how they live from day to day, to know whether they're hypocrites or not. And, of course, that's what Paul points out right here. And then we have verse 19. 
Paul says he served the Lord with all humility of mind. He was humble. And if there ever there was a person that could have been proud, it was Paul. He was the greatest systematic theologian of all time, the greatest church planner of all time, the one who gave us much of the Bible. He was used much of the Lord. He could have been puffed up, but he was humble. And that's a great requirement in a servant of the Lord, to be humble, to not put ourselves forward, to think of others more highly than ourselves. And so Paul was there serving the Lord with humility. And Paul didn't want any grand titles. Today we have the Pope. He has the grand title or title of Vicar of Christ. These high and lofty titles. But Paul wasn't interested in those titles. He wasn't interested in those earthly honors. He came in humility of mind. Then he goes on here, he came with many tears and temptations which befell him by the lying in wait of the Jews. Here the sense of temptations here is testings. In the Bible, temptations is used two ways, as testings and also as being drawn to sin. But here Paul is talking about testings. He had many testings when he was there in Ephesus in his ministry with tears and the lying in wait of the Jews. Uh, in Brazil, we talked about Brazil last night quite a bit in our slideshow talking about the ministry down there and the different problems down in Brazil. Well, one thing I really didn't mention last night was the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel is sweeping Brazil along with the Charismatics and Pentecostals. And they preach that God wants you, of course, first of all, God wants you healthy, but then also that God wants you wealthy. God wants you to have financial prosperity, and all your problems are going to go away when you become a Christian. You want to get rid of your problems. Well, you come to these people's churches, and they say God's going to get rid of all your problems, and he's going to give you financial prosperity. We have one uh, famous preacher in Brazil on the TV. He, ha he puts out a Bible, and on the title of the Bible, right on the front co cover is the Financial Prosperity Bible. Comes right out and says it. And that's what they're preaching there. And, you know, we fight against that in our newspaper down there, the Fundamentalist. But Paul here, in verse 19, he said he had testings, he had problems, he had tears. And you know, as we serve the Lord, we're going to have problems. Uh, all the saints in the Bible had problems. And we're going to continue to have problems as Christians. But God is going to be with us through the problems. God is going to help us, God is going to be with us, and we know we're going to be with the Lord in the end. And we know that God is working all things together for our good when we have all of those problems in our life. But no, when we get saved, God is not going to take away all of our problems. We see that with the Apostle Paul. Then we go on to verse 20. And Paul says to them, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you. And so Paul kept back nothing of the teaching of the Word of God when he was uh, teaching and preaching in that church in Ephesus. You know, a lot of preachers, they keep back part of the Word of God. They preach the gospel, they preach good things, they preach positive things, but they keep back the negative things of God's Word. They keep back some of the things of God's Word. And why do they do that? They do that to be popular, because people don't want to hear certain things out of the Bible. But Paul was not seeking to be popular. He kept back nothing that was profitable unto them. He gave them what they needed and not what they wanted. And we need to keep that difference clear, is that we have churches all over today, they're offering people what they want, not what they need. You know, we have a little grandson, and he's two years old, and all the time he's wanting things that he shouldn't have. And so we give him 
what he needs and not what he wants. He wants a whole lot of candy and he wants to eat more and more and more candy. That's a word that he uses all the time. More, more, more. He wants more, more, more. But we can't give it to him. We have to give him what he needs, not what he wants. And that's what God gives to us. And that's what the preacher in the church, what Paul gave to the people there in Ephesus. He gave them what they needed, not necessarily what they wanted. I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. And then he says he taught them publicly and also from house to house. And that's a necessity in the ministry in the church is to teach from house to house as well as publicly. And it's a necessity to know the people in the congregation, to teach them from house to house. And I don't believe it's very scriptural to have these big mega churches where the preacher can't teach them from house to house, where the preacher doesn't know the people in the congregation. He doesn't know a thing about them. And of course, people like it that way. They like to be anonymous. They like for the church and the preacher not to know anything about them. But not, that wasn't the way it was with Paul. He taught them publicly and from house to house. And then verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And here Paul points out the fact that he was preaching not only to the Jews, but also to the Greeks. That's the word all in the Bible. All. God, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That doesn't mean that God wants every single person that ever lived to come to repentance, but he wants all of the elect to come to pre repentance. He wants all, including Jews, including Greeks, including Gentiles, he wants all types of people to come unto himself. And so he testified to the Jews, to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, we have to be lost before we get saved. We have to see that we're a sinner, and we have to repent of our sin to get saved. Too often we have preaching with just God has a wonderful plan for you and forgets about sin, forgets about repentance. But here we have repentance, turning from sin unto God. And you notice it's repentance toward God, not repentance toward the church, not uh, going to the confessional and telling our sins to the priests. But this repentance is done before God, and we're repenting and turning to him. And then verse 22, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the grace of the, go the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. So here Paul has a little bit of a personal note here that he has been re it has been revealed to him by the Lord that he would no longer see the people in Ephesus. And he was going to Jerusalem. He was leaving Ephesus. He was leaving them and the others around there going to Jerusalem, not knowing what would befall him there. I'm sure they were asking, well, Paul, why do you have to go? Where are you going? And all Paul could say was that he was going to Jerusalem. And he didn't even know what was going to go on there, but he was going there. And of course, uh, we know that he got put in prison there in Jerusalem and finally got shipped off to Rome. But here, he goes bound in the spirit into Jerusalem. And it was, uh, I heard a preacher recently give an illustration. You know, in a classroom, uh, in a classroom, a teacher often moves the students around for their own good. And the teacher doesn't put the students where they want to be next to their best friends. The teacher will put them over on the other side of the room for their own good so that they'll study better 
and have better work in school. And it's the same way with us. God moves us around so that we can better witness for him and have more of a ministry for him. And that's what was happening to Paul. He was being moved around, moved around, but he didn't know exactly where he was going or what he was going to do. Well, he knew he was going to Jerusalem, but he didn't know exactly what was going to happen, not knowing. But God knows what is best for us. And God knows what is the best ministry for us. And we need to be open to his leading. And then we have verse 23, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Once again, Paul knew that troubles were coming, problems were coming. All his problems didn't go away just because he had become a Christian and a great preacher. No, he was going to have bonds and he was going to have afflictions. He was going to have problems. But God was going to, go, going to be with him through those problems. And then he says, verse 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the grace of the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. Paul needed to finish his course. You know, each one of us are here living and breathing because we still have something to do for the Lord. Uh, just recently, down in Brazil, just before we left Brazil, uh, Ira's mother died, and she was 93 years old. And for the past few years, she had always been complaining about, why has God left me living here? What great sin did I sin that God has let me live so long? And she said that over and over again, but we told her, that God still had a job for her to do here on this earth, why she was still alive. And each one of us, when we get older, like her, when she was 93 years old, she couldn't do very much for the Lord, but she could do a little bit. And God has something for us to do. And, of course, we can see uh, that one thing she did while she was alive was that she tied the family together. And when we go back to Brazil, things are going to be different, I would say, with her gone. But we have to finish our course with joy and the ministry that the God, God has given unto us. And then we go on down to verse 26. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And here we go back to Ezekiel chapter 3 and other places in the Old Testament where it has about the watchman. And if the watchman doesn't warn the people, the blood will be upon his head. And if we don't do the things that God would have us to do, if we don't give the witness to others that we should give, well, then their blood can be upon our head. And here Paul he witnessed there in his farewell address that he was pure from the blood of all men, that he had not shunned to declare unto them all the counsel of God. You know, all the counsel of God is not very popular today. It's definitely not very popular. And the Bible tells us that in the end times, in which I think we are living, in the end times, we're told that they will not endure, the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. They just will not endure it. I like the way it puts it there in the King James. They will not endure sound doctrine. And we're talking about Christians here as well as the unsaved. Christians will not endure sound doctrine. Well, to begin with, the unsaved won't endure it. How many people do we have here today? Well, we have just a handful of people. How many people are in the really good Bible-believing preaching churches today? Just handfuls around, a remnant. And who? how many people do we have in Philadelphia today to see the Pope? A million people. The cra big crowds go out for the false doctrine, any kind of false teaching there is. In Brazil, we have the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, everybody's rampant there. And it's because people flock to false doctrine.
but to endure sound doctrine, to endure all the counsel of God, that's pretty difficult in these last times, very difficult. And you know, we today, we here, we are Presbyterian fundamentalists. And you know, Presbyterian fundamentalists are as scarce as hen's teeth. There's very few of them around. And that's because even the Christians will not endure too much of sound doctrine and of the counsel of God. Now, some Christians, they will endure being a fundamentalist, but an Arminian or a Baptist, a Baptist fundamentalist, they'll endure that. Or there's others that will endure being a Presbyterian, but a Neo-Evangelical and not a fundamentalist. But for people to endure being a Presbyterian and a fundamentalist, there's very, very few that will endure that. But you know, that's all the counsel of God. That's what Paul preached. He preached that. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Then go on to verse 28. Verse 28. We're getting down to the wolves. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. And so here we have Paul talking about the flock of God, the flock like sheep. And you know, sheep are not known for being very smart. And that's how it is with Christians and with people in general. They're not very smart to have a million people in Philadelphia today to go to see the Pope, I believe, is not very smart. And you know, people tend to be not very smart. They talk, tend to follow the crowd. And here Paul re refers to the Christians in the church as the flock, the flock of sheep. And you know, Paul in this farewell address, he gives the Ephesian elders a couple of things they need to do. And here's the first thing that they needed to do. They needed to take heed to feed the flock. Take heed to feed the flock. The elders, I'm sure they did preaching. I'm sure they preached after Paul left until he got a new pastor in there. And the, uh, uh, the elders were in charge of making sure that the flock was fed. And, you know, the flock needs to be fed. And the f flock needs a balanced diet, a balanced diet. And that's a problem in many churches. The flock, the sheep, the people in the church don't get a balanced diet. They get the same thing over and over and over and over again. But you know, we need to have a balanced diet. Preaching the whole Bible, all the counsel of God. And you know, a really good way to do that is to preach through books of the Bible. Preach through brick books of the Bible, verse by verse by verse. That way you get a balanced diet. You know, our church, the local Baptist church that we live near there in Brazil, that we attend sometimes, uh, they make a business of not giving the church a balanced diet. They have it uh, each Sunday of the month they preach on a, on on a certain thing, and every month they preach on that same thing. The fourth Sunday of the month is always uh, missions, is always witnessing. And another Sunday of the month is always the family. And the church just doesn't get a balanced diet. And that's what needs to be done. Feed the flock of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And then here, verse 29, we come up to our wolves. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Grievous wolves will enter in. And Paul knew that they would come in. It's all in the providence of God that there are going to be wolves around. And you know, something with wolves, they always run in packs. 
And there will always be packs of wolves, many of them around, devouring people, devouring the souls of men, devouring Christians in the church, in fact, or trying to. And Paul knew that those grievous wolves would come in. And you know, a wolf is not so dangerous when you know he's a wolf. Just like snakes. We were in Cameroon as missionaries, and we had a lot of trouble with snakes. But one fortunate thing there in Cameroon was that we had a monkey who was a snake alarm. And we had this pet, pet monkey, and every time he saw a snake come into the yard, and we had a walled yard, but they still would come down from the trees or wherever, and every time he would see a snake, he would give a certain sound just for snakes. And he would go, click, 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 click. And we knew a snake was out in the yard. We had to go out to get it because we couldn't let that snake hide itself and not know where it is. You have to know where the snakes are. And then they're not dangerous. And, of course, they were all poisonous snakes over there, very poisonous. And it's the same thing with these wolves. You have to know where they are, and they're not so dangerous. But, you know, the problem with the wolves is, is that they dress up in sheep's clothing. I heard that the uh, Pope over in Philadelphia, he, he put a sheep around his shoulders as the good shepherd, and of course he dresses up in sheep's clothing. Do you all remember the story of Little Red Riding Hood? Little Red Riding Hood. And you remember, the wolf came in and got in grandmother's bed and got on grandmother's clothes and put on grandmother's nightcap and tried to act like grandmother. And Little Red Riding Hood came in. And Little Red Riding Hood looked at the wolf and thought something wasn't quite right there. And she said, Well, Grandma, what big ears you have. And the wolf said, Well, the better to hear you with, my dear. And then she said, Well, you, what big eyes you have. And he said, Oh, the better to see you with. And then finally, Little Red Riding Hood said, What big teeth you have! And he said, All the better to eat you with! And then he sprung toward her. Well, you know, the wolf, he dressed himself up like Grandma. The wolves today, in the spiritual world, in the church, are dressed up in sheep's clothing. And you know, Paul tells them to watch for these wolves. Verse 31. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And so they were supposed to take heed to feed the church and they were also supposed to watch for wolves. Well, what are we watching for when we watch for wolves? What was Little Red Riding Hood watching for, or should have been? She was watching for those big ears, those big eyes, and those big teeth. And you know, we need to be watching for things that aren't right with teachers and prophets, false prophets out in the world around us. You know, we have the Pope. He has the big ears of purgatory. He has the big eyes of worship of Mary. And he has the big teeth of salvation by works. You know, this Pope is a Jesuit. And Jesuits all through history have been known for deceit. They have been known for dissembling. And they've been kicked out of many nations all over the world for stirring up trouble and dissembling and deceit. Well, today we have the first Jesuit Pope. And he's going right in the line of the Jesuits, deceiving, and he's acting like such a nice uh, wolf in sheep's clothing. He's got all this sheep's clothing. But you know, he's got those false doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church still. And we need to see those false doctrines of the wolves and see that they are wolves. Watch! Therefore, watch! We need to watch for the false teachers. You know, today in the churches, they want everything new. They want new music. They want new Bibles. They want new preaching. Everything new. Well, when you hear that, you have to see the teeth and the ears and the big eyes sticking out. 
And we have to beware of those things. You know, the Bible is not new. Nothing's new about the Bible. Is it something old? We got that old time religion. Well, uh, we have to beware. Watch for the wolves. And then we have here, it says, also, verse 30, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. And the best example I can think of that is Harold Camping. People of our own selves, people that, that preached reformed doctrine. And yet, he was teaching that the Lord was going to come back in 1994, and then later on, more times, misleading the flock of God. And whenever ever anybody tells you that they know the exact time when Jesus is going to come back, you can see the teeth sticking out. You can see the big ears sticking out. And then finally, after all those false prophecies of the Lord coming back, then he said for everybody to get out of the church and uh, that the church age was over and just listen to him on family radio. Well, uh, of our own selves will men arise speaking perverse things. And you know, many times these wolves are very good at uh, disguising themselves, very good at it. And it's very subtle, the false doctrine that they're bringing forth. But we need to watch, be watching for a little bit of those teeth sticking out. And then we go on here to uh, verse 32. Verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the Lord, the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. So here Paul, he commended the church to the grace of God. And he commended them to the Word, the Word, to be in the Word. I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace. We need to be in the Word of God. We need to be in the Bible. We need to be studying the Bible and seeing what God has to say to us. He speaks to us through the Bible. He doesn't speak to us through the Pope. He doesn't speak to us uh, uh, through the church, per se. He speaks to us through His Word. And then the church should lift up the Word. And here Paul said he had coveted no man's gold or silver or apparel. Why do the wolves devour the sheep? They devour the sheep because they want to eat them. They want something to eat. They want something good for themselves. They don't care about the good of the sheep. They care about something for themselves. And why are all the false teachers out there today? They're interested in something for themselves. You know, the prosperity preachers in Brazil, the, th the, the, the prosperity that really comes through their preaching is prosperity for the preachers themselves. They drive around in huge limousines and huge, they have huge mansions, jet planes, everything you can imagine. And it's prosperity for them. Well, the wolf wants to devour, wants to devour. And I have an interesting example here from the United States of one of these prosperity preachers. And here is an inter article uh, from a little while back. It says, the biggest scam of all, Pastor Creflo Dollar will get his $65 million luxury jet. And so this article from, uh, from the news media was talking about how ridiculous it was, even the unsaved could see, that it was ridiculous for Creflo Dollar, this TV preacher of prosperity, to be going out and buying a $65 million jet for himself. And the uh, Creflo Dollar justified it. He says, because it is the best, and it is a reflection of the level of excellence at which this organization chooses to operate. And then the news media guys here says, this has got to be one of the biggest shams ever. 
And there's so much delusion, it's hard to even figure out where to begin. So much delusion. And the Creflo Dollar, he says, God told him to buy the plane. And he said, if I want to believe God for a $65 million plane, you cannot stop me. Well, you know, we have these prosperity preachers. We have these wolves devouring the flock. And the flock goes, the people flock by the millions to hear these people. This guy wanted 100,000 people to give him $100 each. And they were doing it. And, uh, of course, the old saying is, uh, a sucker is born every day. And that's how it is with the sheep, with people. And we need to watch. Watch for the wolves. Watch for those teeth uh, sticking out. When the guy says he needs a $65 million plane, you can see his teeth. You can see his big ears. You can see that he is a wolf. Well, Paul... He didn't have any of these things. He worked as a tent maker. Can you imagine the greatest systematic theologian, the greatest church planner, this great uh, apostle? He worked with his hands making tents. What a waste of time, you could think. But yet, that was Paul showing by example that we need to work to support ourselves. And then he also points out here we need to work to help those that have needs around us and not just lay up for ourselves treasures on earth. And, of course, that leads into the, measure, the message for tonight about treasures. Well, there are wolves out there. And we got a great wolf right here in Philadelphia today. But we need to take heed in the church to feed the church on the Word of God and as we do that, let's watch. Let's watch for those teeth sticking out of the disguises that the wolves wear. Let's bow in closing prayer. O oh Lord, we thank Thee for Thy goodness unto us. We thank Thee for Thy Word. And O oh Lord, bless Thy Word to our hearts. And O oh Lord, help us to uh, feed the church of God. And O oh Lord, help us also to watch for the wolves for the men of our own selves that are speaking perverse things and help us to be sound in all the counsel of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be confirmed. I didn't tell Brother Olson in advance that I'm in the middle of Acts chapter 20 preaching and the last message, you recall, was about being free from the blood of all men, a quote out of Ezekiel, and he mentioned that fact also. So we encourage you to be in Sunday evening services tonight to hear Brother Olson, and then in the weeks that lie ahead as we continue through the book of Acts. And along those lines, we need to learn to think like Christians so that we can see who the wolves are and discern them. And so our final hymn for this, after, uh, this morning, I guess we are afternoon by now, is 568, May the mind of Christ my Savior will stand to sing.